All right, guys. It is a gray, gloomy, rainy day here in the Sunshine State here. Finally getting a little taste of winter here. And the, as spring kicks off, I think it is 62 degrees outside right now. On Thursday, where are we? March 24th, 2022, as the little dog and I start counting down our days here in the Point Lonesome Swamp. Heading off out of here Sunday or Monday, we are gone for good from the Point Lonesome Swamp. So, <clears throat> a few more rants left from here. So, anyway, guys, I'm just trying to figure out uh, <laughs> where do we start. Uh, I was thinking of starting with the number one story on this planet today, according to Yahoo News. The number one story on the planet, I guess as it should be, that the planet could pass the fabled one and a half degree C in the next 10 years, that it could be only 10 years from now that we pass this uh, point of no return one and a half C, like this is a, a, a some sort of startling new report that we have never heard before. Yes, 10 years, sometime in the next 10 years. I think sometimes in the next 10 minutes, although we're not gonna see 80 degrees here in Florida. Good Lord, I will be gone. I will never again, uh, at least in 2022, see 80 degrees in Florida. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to not bore you with that uh, knee slap right now. Another thing that I'm seeing today is uh, over here, well, on counterpunch and common dreams, checking in with all the lefties, and I understand there's some people... Uh, who have come to the erroneous conclusion that I am not a lefty. Okay, guys, I am a lefty. I am not a lefty. All right, I'm the old school Chris Hedges kind of lefty. So uh, Chris has uh, his article today, Caitlin Johnstone, with, good Lord, her 20th uh, essay in the past two weeks. I uh, see Ken Orphan weighing in on Counterpunch. I had the pleasure of interviewing Ken a couple of years ago. Every one of these lefties making the exact same point, the no-shit Sherlock statement that the United States calling, you know, Joe Biden calling, uh, calling Vladimir Putin a war criminal is, uh, you, you know, like uh, Sancho Panza claiming, uh, I don't know, some Russian dog is a chipmunk killer. Uh, and, and, and all of this screaming and ranting on the left, and, and I 100% agree with this point about the hypocrisy of anybody pretty much in the United States government taking a morally superior position uh, and, and just quietly uh, forgetting to mention that uh, we're all a bunch of war criminals, okay? But, the, you know, it, 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 they always put in there, they all, all these little lefties, uh, that they put in the little, uh, you know, the little parenthetical expression that Vladimir Putin is a war criminal. But it almost starts sounding like uh, it's fine that Vladimir Putin is a war criminal because everyone on this side working f for us is a war criminal too. If Johnny is a war criminal, 
then uh, is it okay for you to be a war criminal? And, and I guess if Joey is a war criminal, then it's okay for Vladdy to be a war criminal. They're all a bunch of goddamn war criminals, okay? I think we get it, Chris Hedges. I think we get it, Caitlin. I think we get it, Ken. We're all a bunch of war criminals. Uh, but of course, the, you know, the, the latest panty wadding uh, going on is, will the Russian war criminal cross the red line of nuclear war? Is the war criminal Vladimir Putin going to actually blow off a nuclear bomb to see how all of the war criminals in, U in the U.S. and the other NATO alliance uh, countries are going to respond and what that's going to turn into. And that, is the, uh, and, and, and that is the big story everyone trying to second guess. Is Vladimir Putin going to push the button or is he not? My personal feeling on this is no, he is not. But anyway, uh, with that in mind, I stumbled across this story right here in today's mainstream media on Yahoo News from this outfit that I mentioned before called The Week. This is written by whoever David Ferris is, pointing out the bottom line of it all, guys. Uh, the inescapable conclusion whether or not that war criminal Vladimir Putin pushes the button whether or not all of the war criminals in the U.S. and NATO and everywhere else on the planet respond in kind. The bottom line is, as he says here, eventually, eventually, our nuclear luck, which is what it is, our nuclear luck will run out. This is not a question anymore of if it is a matter of when. So take it away, David Ferris at the week, and give us uh, your spin. I wish I knew who this guy was. They give no... Uh, pedigree. Anyway, <clears throat> as fears of escalation in Ukraine increase with every day of Russia's deranged invasion, the specter of nuclear war spreads over the planet. Will Vladimir Putin authorize the use of, quote, tactical nuclear weapons? most of which are stronger than the nightmare devices we, he, he left out the word we, the nightmare devices we dropped on Japan in 1945. The risk of annihilation remains low at any given moment, but the longer we allow states, meaning countries, to threaten one another with this kind of eradication, the more likely it is we will eventually stumble into a catastrophic nuclear event. Maybe it won't happen this year, this war, or this century, but in the long term, in a world with nukes, nuclear war is inevitable. The war in Ukraine should, if nothing else, push us to take stock of the inhuman policies that keep total destruction a perpetual option. If we cannot act now when the risk of the worst case scenario has become horrifyingly real, will we ever act? It is true that historically, mutually assured destruction, otherwise known as MAD, MAD 
has made war between nuclear powers less likely. Since the United States dropped atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, not only has no country used these devices in war, but no two nuclear-armed countries have fought a major direct armed conflict with one another. The logic of MAD has held up surprisingly well. There are at least three reasons, however, to be skeptical that MAD will prevent nuclear war forever. First, there is the flip side of deterrence, which is unfortunately what we see today in Ukraine. Putin is using nuclear blackmail to keep NATO out of the conflict. Were he to introduce small nuclear weapons to turn the tide of the war, would the U.S. and its allies really risk a worldwide nuclear exchange by initiating a limited nuclear or conventional counterattack? No one knows for sure because these kinds of questions have been purely theoretical throughout the atomic age. Well, pretty much until now, of course. The second is statistical probability. The number of nuclear powers in the world continues to go up slowly, but the secular trend is clear. And the more nuclear weapons there are in more places, the more likely use, whether deliberate or accidental, becomes. I asked John Wolfthal, who served as an arms control official for former President Barack Obama's National Security Council and is now a senior advisor at the abolitionist organization Global Zero, why he worries about the risk of nuclear war. Quote, Our luck has relied on humans getting it right every single time. Eventually, that luck will run out. Yep, yep, yep. Close quote. Any system designed by fallible people is subject to design flaws, human error, and happenstance, as the terrifying history of nuclear near misses demonstrates. There is no such thing as an accident or mishap-proof technology. Given a long enough time horizon, even the most unlikely event will transpire if the odds are above zero. One last reason is that the instability of the global nuclear regime has never been more apparent as Russia and NATO trade barbs and citizens familiarize themselves with scenarios of nuclear war, countries like Saudi Arabia, Japan, South Korea, Brazil, and others, you know, they're so far non-nuclear countries, and others are left wondering whether anything but nuclear arms will protect them from a more powerful actor, meaning one with nuclear arms, exer exerting its will over them. The present plight of Ukraine, which voluntarily relinquished its nukes after the collapse of the Soviet Union, as well as the experiences of regimes in Iraq and Libya where a nuclear arsenal might have precluded U.S. invasion will only lead more countries to join the nuclear club. 
the non-proliferation treaty and the International uh, Atomic Energy Agency are clever and resilient institutions, but they cannot forever withstand the unrelenting pressure on countries to pursue a technology that appears to bestow immunity from invasion and conquest. And new rivals in possession of the world's most destructive technology are likely to be much geographically closer to one another than where the U.S. than were the U.S. and U.S.S.R. with less intrinsic restraint due to the ever-retreating memory of 1945. Worse, these rival these rivalries can only intensify in a warming unpredictable world beset by climate migration, natural resource scarcity, and existential anxiety. What would it look like if humanity's good fortune vanished? Even for one hour, in her 2004 essay, City on Fire, Lynn Eden walks the reader through what would happen if one single medium yield nuclear weapon were detonated over the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. A one mile diameter fireball would briefly heat up to over 200 million degrees Fahrenheit, igniting a firestorm. The blast radius would flatten buildings for miles. Quoting uh, that essay, virtually no one in an area of 40 to 65 square miles would survive, close quote. Everyone and everything up to 4.6 miles from ground zero would be in flames within 10 minutes or so. Alex Wallerstein's once again trendy nuke map estimates that one 300 kiloton bomb, bomb detonated over the Pentagon would kill more than 248,000 people and injure more than 588,000. The entire population of the District of Columbia, in other words, would be killed more or less instantly. A lucky few might only be gravely injured. Mind you, this is one bomb. In a general nuclear conflict, DC could well be targeted by dozens of nukes and the resulting firestorm alone would likely consume most of suburban Virginia and Maryland. For the survivors, the day after would be just the beginning of their ordeal. In any kind of significant nuclear war between Russia and the U.S., or possibly even if the 300 or so warheads in the arsenals of India and Pakistan were exploded over the cities of that subcontinent, Earth would likely be plunged into a nuclear winter by the smoke from civilization's incineration. The mean surface temperature of the planet could plummet as much as 50 degrees Fahrenheit within two or three years, resulting in a, quote, 90% reduction in the growing season in much of the world, according to science journalist Sarah DeRuin. The one sure way to avoid that fate is disarmament. Yet the nuclear club members have never made a meaningful effort there, 
though abolition is the expressed goal of the global non-proliferation regime itself. This is uh, the late Jonathan Schell, uh, nuclear abolitionist Jonathan Schell, quote, nuclear weapons are distinguished above all by their unparalleled destructive power, their singularity from a moral point of view lies in the fact that the use of just a few would carry the user beyond every historical benchmark of indiscriminate mass slaughter. Close quote. They still would, and it is long since past time to take that option off the table. Yes. So there you go. I mean, that pretty much, uh, with all of the pontificating out there, Sancho Panza, what is your opinion? I know you have to have an opinion. Will the war criminal Vladimir Putin push the button? Since every single human being on the planet has one. <clears throat> uh, I won't repeat that quote. Uh, we all have one. And as I say, my call is we're going to dodge the bullet this time. I am still sticking with the South China Sea. I am, I am holding firm to the South China Sea as being the start of World War III. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how many people are still with me that the South China Sea is where the big kahuna is going to begin. Anyway, I have got to wrap this up. Uh, and I got to start packing up and digging a bomb shelter. I'm heading to Texas in a few days, guys. But uh, I have time for one more ecological meltdown roundup rant. Tomorrow, maybe a Hopium Roundup rant on Saturday, and we will see about a Doomsday Sermon on Sunday. But time is running out in the oasis of freedom. Bye, guys. <laughs>